Hey guys, it's Miss Neal. Give me just a second to plug in my computer. I just realized that it's not plugged in. And we will get started. All right, I think we're good. So, today we are going to talk about, and sorry you got a short visual of what my bathroom looks like, but it was the best solid background I had in my house and the only place I could find quiet to give you a lecture. So, that's what we're gonna do today. Um, so, today we are going to talk about arthropods and phylum arthropoda. I know some of you did these notes last week. Um, and then we took a break and we did that lab on phylum platyhelminthes and the flatworms. Hopefully you found the planaria regenerating kind of cool. Um, we're going to, I'm going to post pictures again today so you can update your lab notebook and you can kind of see them regenerate. Today you should have a web quest on phylum arthropoda to do to get you a little bit more familiar with all the different species. And then tomorrow we'll move on to phylum echinodermata. But let's talk about these arthropodas really quick. Also, I'm going to have a live Zoom call around 10, 20, 10 30 today. Um, it'll be during second block after snack cart. So you can watch this lecture live and you can ask me any questions you might want to ask me. So arthropods are the largest phylum of animals. There's over 1 million known species. There's several that are still completely undiscovered. There are three quarters of the animals on Earth. To kind of give you an idea, there's a ton more bugs than there are humans. There's more bugs. Um, arthropods are bugs. They're insects. So there's more arthropods than there are cats, dogs, humans, and vertebrates all combined. What makes them an arthropod, what makes them different from a mollusk is that they are segmented. It's the first time we start to see that segmentation. We've got bilateral symmetry. This is important. We have an exoskeleton made of chitin, which is a tough non-living exoskeleton. They have to molt this skeleton to grow and it limits their growth. They just can't grow like a human or a squid or a mollusk could. Um, a mollusk was limited by the size of its shell. It had to continuously grow that shell. An arthropod has to shed its exoskeleton in order to grow a new one. And then it's extremely vulnerable in those times where it's still soft waiting for its new exoskeleton to harvest. So it's gonna make them a smaller species all together, all of the arthropods worldwide are smaller than some of your other animals, some of your vertebrates. Um, and they have jointed appendages. So the big things you need to know about arthropods, they're segmented, they have an exoskeleton, and they have jointed appendages. And there is a short video from The Shape of Life that can explain this a little better than me. So we're gonna take a break and watch that really quick. The arthropods' dominance of the sea was greatly aided by one of the most important aspects of their body plan, their skeleton. An arthropod wears its skeleton out. So this is a really good place in the video to kind of pause and you can see the joints and all these appendages and down here again and how they kind of aid that arthropod in movement. Inside its body. This hard shell serves not only as support but as body armor, shielding its soft inner organs from harm. There are times, however, when an arthropod must leave its armor behind. In order to grow, it undergoes one of the most amazing transformations in the animal kingdom. First, the mounting pressures of its growing body crack open its exoskeleton. Beneath the shell, a soft new skeleton has been developing. In less than 30 minutes of struggling and squirming, this crab breaks free of its old skeleton, a process called molting. It 
it emerges with an entirely new covering from legs to body to eyes. Its soft new skeleton will inflate quickly to a larger shell and harden during the next two days. For the soft shell crab, a prized meal of many predators and humans, it's a dangerous two days. So I'm going to be honest with y'all. Um, I am definitely one of those predators. Uh, there's nothing better than fried soft shell crab. It is one of my favorite meals. Um, when we know on the Gulf Coast where I grew up that the crabs are starting to molt, uh, we definitely go out and catch them in abundance and bring back our limit. Um, it's it's just a great meal. I, I don't know how it's one of those special things you grow up doing with your family, I guess. So it has special memories attached to it for me. So let's go onward and upward. So, in phylum arthropoda, most of those animals in phylum arthropoda are land animals and they're insects, but this is a marine class. So we are going to focus on class crustacea. So it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order. So phylum arthropoda, class crustacea. It's a really large group. It's a really diverse group. Everything in class crustacea is an arthropod designed for life in the water. So they all have to have gills to obtain their oxygen. They have a chitin skeleton that's hardened by calcium carbonate. And they all have two pairs of antenna. And so we have our class crustacea. So kingdom, phylum, class, order comes after class. So we have order brancopodia, order maxillopoda, order ostracoda, and order malacostrica. Because that's not a mouthful. Most of the ones you are most familiar with, most of the ones that you would eat as a human, are going to be in this Malacostrica category. Um, it's going to be where your crabs are, where your crawfish are, lobsters, prawns, shrimp, pretty much anything that you might eat as a human would be in this category over here. So let's talk with the smallest crustaceans and work our way up. Um, the first ones we're going to talk about are copepods. These guys are microscopic. You can't see them with your bare eye. Uh, they're the most abundant member of zooplankton. So we talked a lot about how protists made up zooplankton and how protists were in, they're not necessarily considered animals, so we just have to say that protists make up plankton. So these are the actual animals that are in plankton. Uh, this is where your whales and all of your animals that live off of zooplankton and eat, use their baleen to eat are going to get their nutrition from. They use their mouth parts to capture their food, and they have enlarged antenna that they use to swim to keep them from sinking to the bottom of that water column. The most popular one is going to be a sea monkey. Um, sea monkeys were sold as a toy. They were marketed in the back of a lot of comic books and catalogs. You can still get sea monkeys as a toy. I know Amazon sells them. You can get them at Hobby Lobby. Target brings them back at Christmas time. They're very, relatively inexpensive. They're $10. They come with the water and the food for the sea monkeys. So what these are, are these are tiny copepods. Um, you put the water in, you let it sit for 24 hours, I think, until it reaches the right temperature. And then you put the eggs in. The way these guys lay their eggs, you can pull them out of water and they develop a cyst, kind of like a sponge would do with a gemule. And it remains dormant until it reaches that water again. So you put it in the water and you wait so many hours and a new sea monkey grows and you get an entire container full of these cute, cute, cute little bitty shrimp. They're not technically shrimp, they're copepods. And they'll swim all over the container. They're really tiny. There's a microscope, like magnifying glass on the container so you can see them. And they're called monkeys because they look like, you know, monkeys in real life are all over the place. These guys are all over the container. If you want to on your own time, I don't have time in this video to show it to you, but if you click this link, if you go to full page and then you click this sea monkeys link, it'll bring you to the history of sea monkeys and how it was a brilliant marketing idea, essentially, from one man to sell what was considered junk food or food that you would feed breeding fish or um, small turtles, things like that, and how he made it into an actual industry and made millions off of pet food. 
So it's kind of interesting. It's great if you're into marketing or anything like that. It's, great. it's actually a really great watch. It's like 20 minutes though. Next guys we're going to talk about are barnacles. Barnacles are filter feeders, so they don't actively go after their prey, so they're going to filter their food out of the water. They're attached to a surface, so they are sessile for their adult life. Their larvae, however, are modal, so their larvae can swim. We're going to look at a video, or not a video, a picture of their larvae a little bit later on in this lecture. They look like mollusks because they are enclosed by this plate. As a kid, I'm going to be honest with you, I never thought barnacles were a living thing. I always thought they were just kind of a shell, like you find empty conch shells on the beach. I always just kind of thought they were an empty shell. I don't, I don't really know what I was thinking, but that's what I thought as a child. Um, they are actually a crustacean, though. Inside their plates, they do have um, branched and divided legs. So what happens is these two plates are going to open up like a window. The feathery appendages are going to come out and they're going to sweep the water for food. And then they can fold back up inside. These two plates will close up and if the water goes down below their level, they're able to keep the water inside of them and to maintain life until the tide comes back up and covers them again. They do produce their own cement that they use to attach to things. They have a cement gland down here at the bottom. It is extremely, extremely strong. If you've ever had a boat or worked on a dock or known somebody that works on a dock, they will spend days upon days upon days getting barnacles off of their boats, getting barnacles off of their piers. Um, I know as a child, especially if you don't get them off, they're extremely rough. They'll cut you extremely easily. So it's not something that you necessarily want to have around. And we have also studied a lot about their cement to try to make a cement that is like it um, mimic it in the human world or mimic it with synthetic materials because it is such a strong adhesive that they're able to produce themselves through their own body. One of the unique facts about barnacles that always seems to get interesting to teenagers is that in the animal kingdom, barnacles have one of the largest penises in, a, in relation to body size for the animal. So like I said, the barnacle was completely sessile. So it cannot move to find a mate. But we all know that sexual reproduction is more advantageous than asexual reproduction. We want sexual reproduction because we want to share those genes. We want to mix up the genetic diversity. The more genetic diversity we have, the more likely our species is going to continue through evolution and be able to adapt to change. If we continue reproducing asexually and we're all alike, one disease could wipe out the entire population. Um, one change in weather, one change in water conditions, and our whole species is wiped out. So we need to be able to have sexual reproduction to evolutionarily adapt to the things going on in the world. So barnacles have adapted to being sessile by growing an extremely large penis so that they can reach other barnacles around them in their colonies. Um, one of the jokes of marine biologists and scientists is that they have all these shirts that have a tiny, oh, hold on, tiny, tiny little bitty barnacle on them. One barnacle is like super itty bitty, like the size of my pinky nail maybe. And it's got one little barnacle on like the shirt. And then the penis of the barnacle wraps all the way around the shirt and comes all the way back around to the front. That kind of gives you an idea of how long they are. But because this is Miss Neal's science class and I show this video every year, we are going to watch a video on Venmo really quick that kind of shows how they use that to their ad, to their advantage and also shows you what a living barnacle looks like because most of the barnacles you see are usually dead. Usually the animal on the inside is no longer there and all you're seeing is the remains of the animal that was once there. You're seeing their calcium carbonate shell. So let's go to Venme Vimeo really quick, I guess. I don't really know. And give this a watch. So here we have our barnacles. You can see them coming, opening up and coming out to feed. That's what we're going to point out first. Second, this is the barnacle's penis. So you can see how it's able to stretch and reach barnacles that are on a completely different side than it. If it didn't have this adaptation, the only thing it would be able to mate with are the barnacles immediately to the left and the right. But again, that's not going to be advantageous to them. So they're able to stretch it and to reach barnacles on different sides of the colony to produce that sexual reproduction and diversity.
And it's actually really kind of pretty to watch them just come out in and out of their shells and feed. It's, I think it's actually really beautiful. And we'll call it quits there. And get back to the lecture. I'm almost done, I promise. I also promise this is a Diet Coke. That didn't look good there for a second. It's a Diet Coke. Amphipods. Another name for amphipods are um, whale lice or beach hoppers. There's two different um, varieties of the species. Their body is compressed from side to side. So unlike platyhelminthes that were compressed dorsoventrally or top to bottom, these guys are pressed left to right. You can see this guy up here. He's taller top to bottom than he is wide. They're under two centimeters in length. We're thinking itsy bitsy teeny tiny here. Their head and their tail curve downward. These guys are beach hoppers. They use their tail to push them up and kind of hop around the beach. These guys are whale lice. They actually grow on and eat. Think about like lice that humans would get. And those are actually phylum arthropoda too. These are a variation of that same phylum arthropoda, but they live on the skin of whales. They're a parasite that whales can get. Isopods. Same environment as amphipods. These guys, so amphipod, flatten side to side. Isopods, back to that dorsoventral. So they're flattened dorsoventrally. They have some amazing, amazing, amazing camouflage skills. You can barely see them on the fins of this fish down here. Um, they live in the same environment as amphipods. Most of them are parasites. Uh, an example of these guys is called fish lice. Whale lice, fish lice. And you can see there's one right here on the tail of this fish, and here's the other one. Excuse me. You can also see how they have camouflage here. So these are their actual eyeballs and their actual mouthpieces. But when you look at them on a fish, you're seeing, or what you're immediately drawn to, are these false eyes in the back. Those are the ones that you're seeing. So it's a great bit of camouflage that they use in order to help stay alive. Krill are next. Krill are really, really cute. They're planktonic and they're shrimp-like. They're technically not a shrimp. Um, again, I just think they're precious. They're see-through with a slight red color. They are extremely tiny. They're considered a type of plankton. So though they can swim, they do float in the water column. They would be a zooplankton as well because they are an animal. Um, their head is fused to their body segment. This is the first animal we're going to see this in, and this is extremely important because we're going to see this over and over. And this is called a carapace. And this carapace covers the whole anterior half of the body. You see it in crawfish, you see it in shrimp, you see it in crab. So this whole front half, all of these segments are fused and you have one big exoskeleton that's covering all of their important organs. It's covering their heart, their gills, all of those important organs are located in this front part. These guys feed on diatoms. Remember that lab we did on diatomaceous earth? They have the silica shell and the gel-like body on the inside. Uh, these guys are food for penguins, whales, a lot of fish. Um, a lot of animals really, really enjoy krill. It's a delicacy, I guess, for other animals in the sea. Decapods. These are the ones that you are familiar with. So we're finally to the big ones that you're going to be able to look at and be like, oh, I know what that animal is. So decapods have 10 legs because deca means 10. Um, there's five pairs of legs that are walking legs. The first pair of walking legs is modified into claws. So they'll have one pair of walking legs in the front that serve as pinchy, pinchy claws, and then four legs on each side in the back. So they look like they have eight legs, but they don't, they have 10. The largest group of crustaceans in number and in size, so these are gonna be the biggest ones, these are the ones that we can see, and these are the ones that are most prominent and most dominant in the arthropod category, or the class crustacea. Um, these are your shrimps, your crabs, and your lobsters. They have an extremely well-developed carapace. 
It encloses the part of the body called the cephalothorax. The rest of the body is called the abdomen. We have ribs that enclose our cephalothorax, that protect our cephalothorax area, except our head. Our head isn't protected by ribs. We have a skull for that. But remember, evolutionarily, we're not to vertebrates yet. We're still further down than vertebrates, but it's the first time we're starting to see something like this. So we have this cephalothorax that's going to cover their head, their gill region, and protect that. The rest of their body, um, what you would refer to as the tail, like you eat the tail of the crawfish and the tail of the shrimp, that is their abdomen. So shrimp and lobsters have those laterally compressed bodies. They smush side to side. They have distinct and very long abdomens. So here's your carapace in the shrimp. And this, all of this, is your abdomen. Here's your carapace in the lobster. It's the part they're not going to serve you when you go to Red Lobster. All of this in the back is the abdomen. This guy, for some reason, I don't know why, I really think he's cute. Um, my stepdad and my mom bring him back a lot to me when they go scuba diving in the Gulf of Mexico and they can catch one, they bring them back. I have tried for years to get them to give me one for my classroom, but they seem to want to eat them. I don't know why. Um, maybe one day I'll get one. So these guys are called shovel nose lobsters. Those you, see, you can clearly see their four sets of legs. One, two, three, four. They, however, don't have their front legs modified into claws. Their front legs are modified into a shovel. And they use it to scavenge on the bottom. All of these animals, I'm sorry. All of these animals are scavengers. So they're going to eat bits of dead plant and animal material, material that fall on the bottom of the ocean. Um, if you had me first nine weeks, I put the whole video up where I talk about how my stepdad's, my stepdad, my uncle that raised me, his family were a bunch of fishermen and shrimpers. So I grew up on the shrimp boats. Um, I grew up doing demonstrations on the shrimp boats. Because these shrimp are scavengers and they live on the bottom of the ocean, we have something in front of our nets called a tickler line. And that is just a thin chain that runs in front of our nets when we're pulling the net behind the boat. That tickler line, it's heavy, so it's usually going to fall a few centimeters into the sand and get slightly covered. So as it drags along the bottom, it causes all of these shrimp and all these scavengers we want to catch in our net to sell. It causes them to snap their bodies and go up off the ground. And when they snap their body, the net's coming right behind it. So that tickler line is what gets them up off the bottom from scavenging and gets them drawn into our net. Hermit crabs. Hermit crabs are not true crabs. They are scavengers, just like the last animals we talked about. They come in lots of different shapes, lots of different sizes. What you might not know about hermit crabs is that hermit crabs don't make their own shells. Hermit crabs are what you see here. Um, they're actually really gross. If you've ever been to the beach and been to a souvenir shop, they always have hermit crabs for sale in them. You can buy the hermit crab kits at like Petco and stuff, but I haven't seen a lot of live, just big mass hermit crab tanks in there. So what you've got is you've got this little hard, you've got this little animal with a hard exoskeleton on the outside, and he's got a soft abdomen. His abdomen isn't covered in an exoskeleton, so he needs some way to protect it. He's going to find abandoned mollusk shells, mollusks that have died. They've been eaten by another snail because a lot of mollusks are carnivorous. They've been eaten by a sea slug. They've been eaten by a nudibranch. For some reason, this shell has been abandoned. And so this hermit crab is going to back himself in, and he's going to latch his tail around the spiral on the inside of the shell. And he is going to be able to live inside that shell. When he outgrows his shell, his back end starts to outgrow his shell. He can he can no longer like clench his body up and hide in his shell anymore. He needs to find a bigger one. So he'll wander around until he finds that bigger shell. He'll release his tail and then he'll back into the bigger shell and abandon the smaller one. Also, a lot of times you they can't find a bigger shell. So a lot of times on the beach you'll find these guys and like this poor little guy right here, his shell is almost too small for him. So he can't tuck his entire body into his shell. When you find these guys at the beach a lot of times, 
people grab shells on the beach and they don't realize that there's animals on the inside of them because they can usually shrink their body back to the point inside these shells that you can't see them at all. Um, but if you ever go to the beach and you find a bunch of these, find any of these, put them on your hand and stay really still for a minute or two and they'll actually come out and they'll start to walk across your hand. They can't hurt you. They can't pinch you. If they do pinch you, their pinchers are so tiny you won't even feel it. It's, they're kind of fun to watch. When I was a kid, we used to build castles for them. My only request is that if you play with them, please be gentle with them. And like always, please return them to their natural habitat and make sure you're providing them with water while you are playing with them on the beach. We don't want to kill anything that might upset the natural habitat. Crabs. Yum. Also a lot of fun. Um, crabs are a very unique arthropod. They're one of the quickest and easiest to identify because of the shape of their shell. So their abdomen is small, super, super small. We had these shrimp and lobsters with these massive abdomens. We get here to the crabs and our abdomens are tiny, 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 and they're tucked around the bottom side of the animal. All of this across the top, this top shell, is its cephalothorax. It's extremely broad. Um, where was I? The abdomen is in a female. It's in a U shape. In the male, it's flattened and in a V shape. It also resembles the same sexual reproduction parts in a human. That's the way I remember it. Um, in a human and in most mammals, males have a penis. If you look on the underside of a male crab, their abdomen is in approximately the same shape. If you look on the underside of a female crab, their abdomen is in approximately the same shape as a female's uterus. So we're already starting to see that delineation there. They're extremely highly mobile. They do crawl from side to side. They can crawl from front to back, but it's not their preferred method of traveling. Most of them are scavengers. Um, they can live their water complete. They can live their life completely in the water. Some of them live their life completely on land, in that higher intertidal zone. So they can get a little bit wet, but they prefer not to be wet. There's hundreds of varieties of crabs. There's blue crabs. There's stone crabs. There's spider crabs. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, if you've, I don't even know. I they're one of um. I forgot to include the link on the exit ticket the other day. They're one of the main exports of the state of Mississippi. In other places around the United States, you're only allowed to eat the female or the male crabs. You have to throw back all of the female crabs. They have been overfished to the point where you can't get a lot of them. So when you go to those places, um, Maryland is one of the most famous states. It's known for its crabs. A lot of people have crab boils there. Um, it's also the only other brackish estuary area we have in the United States, which could be why it's the only other place you can find blue crabs in the United States besides the Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana area. They have overfished theirs there to the point where they are actually buying them from the fishermen in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama. So you might not think of seafood and crabs as an export from our state, but it's an extremely valuable export from our state because we've been regulating it for so long. We do have the ability to not overfish. Um, just like most of y'all here hunt or know somebody who hunt and you get tags. When you crab, you get uh, you have to tag your traps, and you also have to tag the bags of crabs you bring in, and you are only allowed so many tags per season. So it definitely keeps that population in check and allows us to remain, it also allows us to keep the population healthy. Uh, a lot of y'all that hunt know that if you don't hunt, the population can get out of control. You can also overhunt, and the population can get too small. Same thing happens here with crabs and with the crabbing industry. Oh, another way you can tell a male from a female crab is female crabs like to have their nails done. So the female blue crabs will always have red tips. The males are lacking those red tips. And fiddler crabs, the male fiddler crab has a giant claw and a small one. The female has two even sized claws. You can also see another example of this giant claw up here. 
Onward and upward. How do they eat? How does it work? Where's everything located? So let's talk about it. They are filter feeders. So the planktonic crustaceans are filter feeders. They have bristles on their appendages that catch their food. They have specialized appendages that carry the food from their bristles to their mouth. The bottom crustaceans have maxillopeds, and those are appendages close to their mouth. And they're turned forward, and they sort out their food. The food then goes from the maxillopeds into the stomach that has chitin or teeth for grinding and bristles for sifting. The digestive enzymes break down the food and absorb the nutrients. The nutrients are distributed through an open circulatory system. We don't have a closed circulatory system yet. The only one we've seen so far is in the octopus and the squid. And then the intestines, if they go around the back of the animal, and a crab, this is the side of a crab, this is the side of a shrimp. They go around the back of the animal, and the anus is down here on the back side. Let's see if I can find the video. Give me just a second. Um, crab eating maxillopeds. Let's see. There's a great video out here. Um, hermit crab eating. Let's see what, this is a blue crab. Let's see what we got. There's one where there's a we'll white crab the eating version. her baby. What if everyone great. gave you the value that the general does? May I? With a f you can still see the maxillopeds here, though. There's those maxillopeds. Right here. So that's what helps bring the food into their mouth. like I'm being watched. I don't want to eat in public. So there's those maxillopeds down there on the underside going to work. All right, this is getting lengthy. I'll, I'm going to wrap it up, I promise. There's like three more slides. So um, gas exchange is carried out by gills. Um, water enters the body at the base of the chillipeds. It filters around and it goes out the front of the carapace here in the crab. In the decapods, the gills are in a chamber under the carapace. That carapace is protecting the gills. In both animals, the carapace is protecting the gills. Um, they're constantly bathed by water. There's a constant flow of water that goes through that carapace area that keeps them oxygenated. Nervous system and behavior, they have a relatively simple, small brain. They have compound eyes. And some of them, like the praying mantis, or not the praying mantis shrimp, the mantis shrimp up here, um, they have 14,000 light-sensitive units grouped in a mosaic. Those shrimp can see more colors than a human can see. If you want to watch another fun video, I don't have time to show you, um, but it's another great video on the mantis shrimp. Its punch packs more pounds per square inch than a human can pack. And again, it can see colors that aren't even visible to the human eye. Really kind of impressive. Uh, the video is right up here. Again, just put it in full screen mode and click on it. It'll bring you to the video. They have statocysts for balance. So the first time we saw those was in jellyfish, and we haven't seen those again since those rudimentary ones in jellyfish, but they've come back again. Um, they're the most behavioral complex vertebrates. They use signals to communicate, so they can use body posture, they can use legs, they can use antenna movement. Um, a lot of them will even release urine into the water to communicate that way. So there's a lot of different ways they can go and communicate with the other people, with the other species in there and the other people, not people, other animals that are there with them. So sexes are finally separate. Um, males use specialized appendages to travel, the, to transfer the sperm directly to the female. 
Um, barnacles, like we said, have a penis that can stretch to reach to nearby barnacles. Mating takes place immediately after the female molts while the exoskeleton is still soft. That's extremely important. If the exoskeleton is hard, the male can't transfer their sperm to the female. You can't get in the exoskeleton. They do have planktonic larvae that go through a metamorphosis. So those planktonic larvae look nothing like the adults. So let's take a look at some. This guy right here is eventually going to become a crab. So this is his first stage. You can already start to see the carapace, right? Here's the abdomen. We're seeing him start to develop a little more. You've got his claws. His eyes are starting to protrude on those eye stalks. You're beginning to see that enlarged carapace and that in smaller tail. Next, we have these guys right here. I'm going to move the picture for you for a second. These guys are the larval stage of a barnacle. So they will eventually settle down on the bottom to resume their sessile lifestyle. Um, some other marine arthropods that we haven't had time to talk about. We've got horseshoe crabs. They are class Meristomata. They're not true crabs. They're considered living fossils. This tail will not hurt you. I could, just like I said, I could teach an entire class on octopus. I could teach an entire year on horseshoe crabs. They are amazing animals. We use their blood for a ton of research and a ton of vaccines. They have a main vein that runs right here along the back of their body. We can fold them in half and we can draw that blood from them and use the blood from them. In doing so though, we haven't been giving them the most humane treatment. We thought we could release them right back to the ocean and they'd resume their behavior. We found that a lot of times when we re-release them back to the ocean though, they stop mating. They don't return to their mating grounds with their other species. And they kind of isolate themselves and almost commit a horseshoe type suicide thing. So we're really starting to look into that in the marine community and see how we can use them beneficially, but how to humanely use them beneficially. They're really cute. This is the animal that I spent the most time with when I worked at the J.L. Scott Marine Education Center in high school and college. This was the guy that I always brought out and did talks to and went to the schools with. Um, also really, really cool. This is their mouth right here. You can put their food right here on their mouth and they'll take their claws and kind of push it in piece by piece into the bottom of their mouth. They can pinch you with these claws. Again, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't bother you. They're very docile animals. The only reason they have this really long, sharp tail is to flip themselves back over if they already get stranded on their backside. The next guy we have is up here. These are sea spiders. Their class, I'm not even going to attempt it. And they resemble real spiders. These guys live in the hydropelagic zone or the abyssopelagic zone, and they're most common around hydrothermal vents. Uh, they can start out about, you know, this size. These are one of your, this is probably one of the biggest crustaceans. Um, they can get four and five feet across. These guys are absolutely huge. Um, and they resemble real spiders. They've got eight long legs, a tiny little body in the middle. Their claws are very subdued in the front. So that is all I have on Phylum Arthropoda. Today you are going to complete a web quest on Phylum Arthropoda. Like I said, let's get back to Schoology over here. Can I make it small? Make it small. So we have made it through elections, we've made it through mollusks, we have made it through the arthropod notes, so hopefully you've done the notes on this yet, you just haven't seen the lecture. Um, things have been going a little different at school and in, at school just because Fridays are shorter at school, the planaria came in at a weird time, so it's kind of been a little bit different. Y'all are all getting the exact same lessons, they're just a slightly different order. Um, so... Today, you have the Phylum Arthropoda web quests and the labeling questions, and then you need to complete your exit ticket and your attendance forms. So here's your web quest. You're just going to follow the links and answer the questions. So it says, visit crustaceans wonderfully diverse. 
and then it asks about the different classes and categories, the heaviest crustacean in the world, how they're distinguished from different groups. It also has some different websites you're going to go through throughout to look at the different subspecies and subclasses. Let's go back to November 9th really quick. Let's look at this anatomy assignment that you have. So in the anatomy assignment, you have your descriptions of what all the different things are. So an antenna, a carapace, a chelipid, an eye stalk, a mouth, and walking legs. And then of course you have a male fiddler crab and you're going to grab and drag. So your walking legs are in the back, your eye stalk is where your eye is, so on and so forth. Hopefully you can figure out the mouth and the antenna and the chelipad from there. How do you know the one in the picture is a male? And then it's going to have you identify what I am pretty sure is a shrimp. Yes, here's your shrimp. So, oh, crawfish, sorry. Um, you're going to identify the crawfish. This one can be slightly confusing because the picture is not having you label everything in the picture. So let's go through this really quick. This one is asking you to label. So you've got your carapace here. Here I'm asking you to identify what this piece in the back is, which is your abdomen. Whoa. Obviously, you've got your walking legs. These guys in the back here are used for swimming. You've got a tail fan. You've got your chelipad, which is another way for saying your claw or your pincher. You've got the cephalothorax. Remember, you've got your carapace, your cephalothorax. You've got your antenna right here. You don't have to label the long antenna, just the short antenna. Your tail fan. So this one points to the entire tail fan. This one points to the units of the tail fan. And then you have a shrimp. And it asks what feature is present on the shrimp, the crab, and the crawfish. If you ever get stuck on any of these labeling pictures, the website you can use for help is going to be this EnchantedLearning.com website. If you go to EnchantedLearning.com, it has a link at the top where you can put in what you're looking for. It's got a search, so it says search the site. So I want to search the site for crawfish because that's what I'm having you label. And then the very first thing is a labeled crawfish. So hopefully this should help you in identifying and getting 100. A lot of y'all do get 100 already on these labeling pictures, but hopefully this should help a lot of you get those extra 100 you need, those extra easy daily grades. And then from this one, again, the link is right down here at the bottom, or not the link, the search, you can search for where you're looking for, a sea urchin, for instance. We haven't gotten there yet, but that's going to be on the next one. And then here's the sea urchin labeled. So hopefully this will help you. It also gives you a little bit more description about the adult anatomy, the diets, the sea predators, the reproduction, things like that. I know we don't have a book for this class, so this is kind of where a lot of the information comes from, and it's a short, abbreviated version of all the information. I hope you have a great day. I hope I see a lot of you at 1020. If you have any questions or concerns, I would love to answer them for you then. Have a good afternoon.